So, how you doing? Doing good, man. I'm doing good. Glad to have you. So, I thought it was important for us to have this conversation because I learned uh, a little bit more about you. Some history, we've known each other for a while, but I, yep. I, I didn't know this aspect, but I think it's, it's helpful for, for others to kind of be brought in for sure. on the conversation. So, before we get too far along, uh, give us some history. Where are you from? Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, mm -hmm. 843. Yeah. And currently? Currently, I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina, Southeast Raleigh, to be exact. Yeah. Moved up a little bit. Yeah, a okay. little bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, what was life like in South Carolina, uh, 843, Myrtle Beach? What was that? What was that like? Man, it's interesting growing up in a tourist town. Okay. Because for me, I didn't really understand. You know, when you're in an environment, it's hard to really assess what normal is when your normal environment looks maybe different True. than someone else's. So, I mean, it was plenty to do during the summertime, not a lot to do during the wintertime. Um, I would say probably the thing that shaped me the most more than like the city that I lived in, or really, it's really more of a small town if you really think about it in the grand scheme of things. But it was really my relationship with my family, relationship growing up as a minister, like a, a, a PK, those kind of things I think really shaped me even more so than just the environment of the city. So your dad was a preacher? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. So he led the all of the Sunday, Sunday morning uh, Bible studies and uh, Sunday school and all of that stuff. Um, at one point in time, he was the, the basketball coach for the private school that I went to. Yeah, so I mean, he was just a community guy, mm -hmm. um, kind of almost kind of like the father figure for a lot of my friends that maybe didn't have father figures and things like that. Yeah. Well, I know that when somebody hears PK, they think, oh, well, you church kid, mm -hmm. doing everything right, mm -hmm. perfect, perfect life, smooth, smooth sailing. Mm -hmm. uh, was that your situation? No. <laughs> <laughs> really? Nah, I mean... I would I would say one great thing that I can say about my parents was generally what you saw outside was what you got inside, right? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't like my dad was like preaching one thing and then we get home and it's like the exact opposite of that. Yeah. I mean, or at least from my perception as a kid, you yeah. know what I mean? You didn't have that my parents are living double lives. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like my, my parents- Like some you, PKs do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Where you kind of see a completely different- so I, nah, I mean, he was, they they were just fairly just authentic people. It wasn't like, you know, at one point in time, you know, they're, hey, how you doing, sister so-and-so? And then, mm -hmm. you know, they get home and they curse the sister so-and-so out. Right. You know, not one of those kind of things. But I do feel like it was like a lot of stress, maybe that wasn't intended, but of kind of like perfectionism, like holding up that kind of standard as well mm -hmm. as a kid that I really struggled with as, as far as being like a PK. Yeah. So... You said things didn't necessarily go the stereotypical way one would think a preacher's kid go. So do you think that this, the standards uh, or expectations is what pushed you further to not kind of fall in line? Um, eventually, I mean, I, I feel like at first I tried to live up to expectations and those expectations just broke me. Okay. And from me just being like, I can't live into this kind of really would have been like self-righteous, oh, I'm doing these things and this makes me a good person kind of mode that I'm just like, I'm done with it. I'm going to move on and kind of live in a more authentic way to mm -hmm. me rather than this, what I perceive to be just this overall kind of Christian standard of goodness that just to me was like impossible to upkeep. Mm hmm so you said the expectations broke you. So mm -hmm. help me understand what were the expectations and what do you mean by they broke you? Yeah, so I remember clearly, like literally one Sunday, and it's probably happened multiple Sundays, but um, like our lead pastor was preaching from the pulpit and literally said, oh, you kids need to be like KO. You need to think before you do things. You need to do it, you know what I mean? And even as a younger kid, I would like sit with the like the the elders and the church leaders. I would go on trips with them. I was kind of like a assistant to the lead pastor, got the, you know, once the car pulled up, got the bags, all that kind of stuff. 
went on trips, that kind of thing. You know, you're talking about like my early child. I'm, I'm guessing maybe from like nine to maybe 12, 13 or so, something like that. And so kind of being the kid made it hard. Cause I mean, and probably my parents probably didn't mean it in this way, but it came off this way. But like there'd be times like I would like get in trouble at school or something like that. And, or I'm acting up at the house and it'd just be like, hey, do we need to, do we need to tell the pastor about this? You know, and I remember one time getting sat down for something, you know, it was like more home or school related. Uh, and it was just like, yo, like, do I ever have this chance to mess up? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That that was kind of what I was like dealing with. It was like, I don't feel like I have a lot of opportunity to to mess up or and, slip. Yeah. And then those expectations kind of broke you in what way? Yeah. I mean, I remember probably maybe like 14. I think I was like 14. I was going into, I was either going into my freshman year or or sophomore year, it was somewhere freshman, sophomore year. I just remember this moment and I was like really trying to be on fire for God and reading my Bible and praying and, you know, and I only listen to gospel music, all of that kind of stuff. I tucked my shirt in my pants at school. I was like, yo, that was bad, weird. Anyway, mm -hmm. but not that it's wrong, <laughs> but it was weird for me, for my vibe. You know, and I just remember being in the shower one day and just being like, I cannot continue to do this. Like, I just cannot keep trying to do the right thing. Although I really don't want to do the right thing. I want to do all the wrong things that I shouldn't be doing. You know what I mean? And I didn't feel like there was any real support in navigating that thing. So I was just like, I quit. I'm just going to just do me and try to just be a decently good person mm -hmm. and just try to like figure it out myself. And that's just how I'm going to live my life. And what does do me look like? Do me look like, man, going out with my cousins, getting into some really crazy situations. I mean, as far as like, I mean, I, I you know, I don't want to incriminate myself and I think I'll be past the incrimination <laughs> period, but let's just say there was a lot of things that happened that I'm glad that I never got caught up until I did get caught up into any kind of legal situations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, and the, the thing was, it wasn't like I was like out there trying to prove that I was bad or tough or anything. It's just that my circle was kind of like, hey, you have the family church life and this safety, and then you go out and you go off the porch and you got the gang members, the drug dealers, all those people are my friends. Like, mm -hmm. and they're not even expecting me to deal drugs or join the gang or anything else, but they like, hey man, you cool with us, man. You can roll with us, you can da da da. When, when the heat gets high, you know, all right, Kale, you can chill right here. You know, cause for even them, they kind of, I guess, you know, like in the black community, we usually have this thing where we have like folks that they look out for you. They're like, you might go somewhere, so we're gonna look out. Right. And so I was still in the mix, but I didn't necessarily have to partake in special. all of the festivities. You got a future. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I, I was in the black man, you got a future category. Mm -hmm. And so I was cool with that. Yeah. Okay. So I uh, feel like I'm hearing in terms of extremes, you got the church folk over here and that crowd, but then you got the street folk over here. Mm -hmm. And basically you didn't feel comfortable living up to the expectations of the church folk yep. and that eventually led you to lean more into the other yeah. community. Yeah, for sure. I mean, because I think that's one of the tough things about church culture, right? It's like, we say, accept me as I am, and then you grow and develop, but it's like, as soon as you don't do something right, or you don't do what is expected, there's like an easy alienation or isolation that happens. Even when you want the help, it's more of how you're perceived to be than actually what's actually internally going on inside you, where in other spots and other spaces, you're accepted more for who you are, even if it's not necessarily the same you know, and so the level of relationship and the environment of like my cousins and my friends felt way more welcoming for who I actually was at that moment than the expectations that I had from folks that 
you know, went to my church. I mean, and, and that's the other thing. Just for me, it's like when I'm not feeling something, it's just hard for me to act like I'm feeling. It. Mm -hmm. And so even when I started going at that point, it was like just readily known, like, nah, I'm here because I got to be here. But I ain't doing nothing. Mm -hmm. And if I am doing something, I'm going to make it hard for everybody. You're going to know I don't want to do this. Yeah. So when you went to the other extreme, did it get better? Were you good then? Oh, man, it was it was fun at first. It was great. Okay. I mean, it was great. I mean, it was kind of just like, oh, man. There, I, it wasn't like this, like, oh, man, I went over here and, you know, next week I was like, oh, Jesus, I miss you so much. It was just like, oh, man, I could finally be myself. Mm -hmm. Whatever that means, you know, kind of that self-discovery space. Um, now nah, it was, I mean, that was the, I think the good part about it, right? But then you kind of just get deeper and deeper in the situations. And again, I think kind of coming back to the beginning of the conversation, your environment and everything that's going on, you don't recognize how much you are actually changing and becoming more like your environment than your environment as actually, like, are you making your environment change? Mm -hmm. I guess you can say. And so, I mean, if I'm answering your question, yeah, I mean, it was it was great at first. And then it was like, as the years progressed, as things got more serious, I started to become more aware of kind of the dangers and the inconsistencies in myself and my own mm -hmm. values that I was actually like living out. Okay. And when you say dangers, what are you, what are you referring to? Uh, and I, I asked that just because there's a lot of folks out here specifically black men mm -hmm. who might've been raised in church, but yep. also deal with the street dudes mm -hmm. and make that transition. And it's whatever, mm -hmm. you know, it's not really an issue and they don't necessarily see a danger because mm -hmm. that's the environment. It's so normalized. So for you, what did you see that made you go, okay, there's a danger here rather than this is just life. Yeah. Oh man. I can think, <laughs> I can think of so many different times. Like, a time when uh, a group of my friends, this is like, I'm like, actually, I, I'll give the story a little bit. So I'm, I'm maybe like 15 or so. Um, and I'm literally leaving a church youth event. I get picked up by a group of friends. We're riding. We end up seeing some other people we know. And at first, it seems like everything's good. We walk off. They end up walking off, following us. And then it becomes an issue. And then this other group, Someone from that group is just like, hey, y'all from this side of town. And then uh, then we like, nah, we from this side of town. And then he goes into his coat. We think he's about to pull out something. Somebody from our group, they go into the car and just clink. You know what I mean? Go ahead and put one in the chamber. And I'm like, how did I just get here? Mm -hmm. <laughs> how did this just went from like going to this like little, getting picked up from this little church youth event to there's like a real possibility that someone just might get shot mm -hmm. or another situation. I was supposed to meet some friends. They ended up getting into a fight and two of them ended up getting shot. And it just so happened that I couldn't find the spot that I was supposed to meet them at. And I went to go see another friend before I got up with them. So it had been like multiple times of that, or someone ended up getting into a situation and the police gets called out. Like I remember one time there was a situation that happened Police got involved. Everybody's running. I see one of the police officers. He sees me, but he knows my dad. And he knew me from when I was a little kid. And I used to come to the gym that my dad worked out at, um, where we used to live every day. And he's going out to grab me. And he just, like, puts his hand back and just lets me keep running. So... And you, like you said, that's one of many. One of stories. many, yeah. That's a, it's a lot of different stories, yeah. but I mean, I guess the the thing even for that was like I, it was just hard for me even in those situations to eventually not ask why, mm -hmm. like why are things the way that they are? And sometimes yeah. it was just getting involved to not have to deal with what was happening in my mind internally, particularly mm -hmm. because it wasn't like it wasn't like I always felt like, oh, I'm good, I'm okay, I'm just having a bad moment. A lot of times I really felt like something's going on with me internally, but I don't know how to express it and I don't really know how to get the support that I need in order to address the concerns that I feel like I have for myself. Yeah, so you said that you were kind of doing other things to avoid dealing with what was going on with you internally. What do you mean by going on internally, what's that? 
I mean, just, yeah, I would say coping, trying to cope with just feeling not necessarily, I haven't had a clinical diagnosis for this, but depression, um, just my mind always racing and just trying to find ways to deal with that without necessarily having those conversations or, or seeking counseling. Um, and I think that kind of continued to drive me towards dependency on, you know, relationships and trying to, you know what I mean? Really just trying to maneuver with, with women, trying to maneuver with my friends and figuring out how we can get and get the things that we want. I mean, overindulgence and uh, shoot music, anything, almost anything that I would want to, that I liked a lot. It was just like, I could just overindulge in that. You know what I mean? I mean, issues with uh, pornography, all those kind of things, right? To try to cope with not necessarily feeling normal, mm -hmm. but not knowing how to express that all the time. So, I, it makes me think of, well, what is the reference point for what normal is? Yeah, that's like, a good one. So did, like, did, did you start feeling abnormal because of the church environment or the street environment, or have you always had that feeling? And if so, what's your reference point of what normal is? Yeah, so, no, nah, I've pretty much always had that feeling, like a certain level of aloofness, I would say particularly to like emotional developments, like, or so, just like, or intensity of emotion and things like that. Like, cause I grew up Pentecostal, right? Okay. And so like, you know, it'd be jumping up, shouting and all this. And I just remember even as a little kid, just being like, whoa, this is too much. Okay. <laughs> Church you know, folk doing too much. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is like too much. This makes me feel uncomfortable. And even though I like got used to it as I got older, it never felt normal to me, right? Or how people navigated in relationships and why people did certain things and some of the more unspoken rules of how people respond to things. Sometimes it's just like, okay, so why, why did you just say this? but you're doing this now. Mm -hmm. Like those kind of things were just things I always questioned. And I feel like a lot of times for my friend, I'm like, like, why are you even thinking about that? And it's like, cause I can't stop asking why, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And so I think that already felt like there was a difference. Not saying that none of my friends ever did that too, but it just didn't seem like most of my fr friends and people that I knew, they were more just about kind of, well, this feels good. I'm just going to do it. Why are you doing it? I don't know. I don't even want to think about why. Like, don't ask me why. It makes me feel weird, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. If you can remember, what was your earliest feeling or what was the earliest moment where you said, I feel like something's off or I'm not, I'm not okay? Mm. I'll probably say one of the earliest things I can think of, and it's probably, you know, related to church life and all this stuff, was like questioning what would happen when I die. And, you know, given that I am a Christian now, but trying to figure it out back then was like, all right, like, if I go to sleep when I die, where I'm going to end up at? You know, because, you know, being a costume and, you know, 90s, 80s, I guess, whenever, it's just like, you know, if, if you don't wake up, if you don't wake up tomorrow, where will you be? You know, mm -hmm. and that just as my as a kid, just like really wrecking me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I have anxiety almost every single night I went to sleep. And I mean, I can't even remember being a small kid and not having anxiety about going to sleep most nights. I mean, and even for that, one of my coping strategies started to be to listen to music, like listen to music until I fall asleep so I can try to concentrate on music and not thinking about mm -hmm. what would happen to me if I'm no longer here. Mm -hmm. How far did this, uh, cause you know, when you throw depression out there and I hear you saying that you had feelings of depression haven't actually been diagnosed yet mm -hmm. but when people hear that term there's a lot associated with it yeah so could you be a little more specific in terms of how that played out for you as far as when you hear depression you might think this yes that's me or you might think this no that wasn't me yeah so if you're thinking depression and like oh I'm here in every situation I'm crying and I'm like looking out to everybody like, hey y'all, I'm sad. Like, I think that's like a very, and maybe that might be some person's mm -hmm. experience, but definitely not mine. It was more of just kind of like, if, say if you were like watching a TV show, right? And it just automatically just went black and white, right? Like you can see everything, 
and everything's still there, mm -hmm. but the color, the vibrancy of life, of like, of everything is kind of just sucked out of it, right? And like, you just can feel like you're easily just going through the motions. It's like, man, like, I just don't even, okay, I'm up today, I'm here, okay, what else? Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like the feeling of not necessarily having any satisfaction out of what you're doing. It's almost kind of like even questioning, like, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. Like, I'd just rather just not have to do any of this stuff, you know? Or just the energy level of just doing normal things just feels like it's taking everything that you have. It seems like those types of feelings, if they're sustained for an extended period of time, mm -hmm. that could make one just get to a point where it's like, like, why um, am I even doing this? Yeah, I mean, yeah. and that was actually kind of something I was just thinking about with that feeling was just like, it started just to become with, I would say, just the added stressors that started to come up in my life, particularly like in my early 20s, started just to become like, why am I even here living like this anymore? You know, it started, I think one of the first things kind of looking back that started to become kind of one of those moments was like, I started to self isolate. Like I would hardly talk to anybody. I would show up to work and maybe do that, but I would not really bring anyone into my circle. And I got very scarce. And then I also started just sleeping heavily. Like, I would rather be sleep than be up and moving around because it just felt like just life was so draining that it was like, I'd almost rather just stay sleep and i think maybe even in that stay sleep it started to be like well what if that was it i just didn't have to worry about getting up anymore and that started to feel scary but comforting to mm -hmm. think of not having to deal with life in the capacity that it was because it just felt like it was just too much to continue you know what i mean um and i mean and, and it I would say even with the the anxiety of just being a kid thinking about death all the time, like death wasn't anything that was just like, oh, I only think about death during funerals or when someone dies. It's just like, I would say even now, it's not like I don't, I think there's healthy ways to think about, you know, death and there are very, very unhealthy ways. And I think for a long time, I have very, very unhealthy ways of thinking about death, mm -hmm. right? And um, for me with factors, I mean, dealing with uh, some criminal stuff, um, just th my friend group and everyone kind of moving and splitting apart, um, not really having solid foundations of like relationships that were very restorative to me. It just became easier to just be like, you know, I just want out of this whole situation. I feel completely misunderstood. I feel like I am becoming a burden to the people that even do care about me and I don't really have much to offer them. I don't really see what I have to offer myself anymore. It would just be best for me and everyone else if I, just to be blunt, just kill myself. Just mm -hmm. like get out of this. This is a nightmare. Like who would want to be in this terrible world with all this hurt, with all this pain, with no one caring about anyone or anything else besides himself? And me also feeling the same way. Like I just want what's best for me too. You know, and so that just seemed like a better situation than to continue to like live in just this state of like constant dread and anxiety that I felt like I woke up to every day. And even my sleep was terrible. Like I at one point in that situation, like every time like even going to sleep became terrifying because every time I went to sleep I just had like a horrifying like night terror. I mean, and I would be sleeping like sometimes, like if I was off 12, 14 hours a day sleep, you know, and then in between sleeping, I mean, not leaving my house, sometimes not eating at all, uh, you know, and also in a sense, not even wanting to be consoled. Like I wouldn't even want someone to just be like, hey, how are you doing? I would probably have gone off on that person like, just just feeling completely like alienated from the world at that point yeah yeah so how far did this go for you because i i I mean you even mentioned you know the idea of suicide yeah and 
it seems like in how you explained it, you were already thinking about death because of the church background, mm -hmm. and heaven or hell and that mm -hmm. whole thing. Then there's life circumstances, life not feeling fulfilling, yep. not being hopeful. Yep. So there's that. So you've talked in and around near the idea of thinking about death. Mm -hmm. Did that ever get to a point where you actually were considering? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know what? Actually, and I guess this is probably like I hadn't really, I think. But I mean, like I had thought about, thought about it, about ne maybe not making a plan. Mm -hmm. I mean, even as like a younger kid or even in my teenage years, but like in my early 20s, like when it was just like the, I think the most heaviest impact of like, you know, I've been able to kind of skate out of these feelings of depression before but it just felt like i was consumed by it mm -hmm. and like this dread of like none of this even matters anymore you know and that particular space just made me then start to plan okay so how am i gonna do this and i mean it got really bad like it got bad where i started considering i mean things that i think you know, but just to be honest with where I was at at that moment, but horrible, like, all right, you know, I could just drive and I could just drive off of this bridge or I'd be walking like to a store near my neighborhood. It's like, I could just jump off. I could just jump off it right now. Like if I do it faster, it would be easier, you know, or the worst, which feels even shameful, but was true or just like, okay, I'm just going to drive in oncoming traffic. Like, I'm just going to do it now. You know, um, and the biggest one as far as like when it was at its worst was I had my birthday was coming up and this was like either nine or 10 years ago. And like in my mind, that was it. This was the day. This was the day I was like, everything seemed to kind of work out. I hadn't told anyone that this was the plan, but it was kind of like in my mind, this is the plan. I knew how I was going to do it. I was going to get drunk. I was gonna slip my wrist. I knew the alcohol would allow my blood to thin out where it would probably happen. Mm -hmm. And my roommate was probably gonna be out, so which he was, which it was just like, it seemed like that was going to be it. Cause I just like literally was like, I cannot live another day in this feeling of pain that I feel. Um, and by this time I didn't have a cell phone. You could only reach me if you called me at work or emailed me. Uh, I didn't pretty much have anybody besides the roommate that already lived there come to see me, anything. I kind of had just, I mean, I hadn't even talked to my parents in probably at least two to three months at that point. I remember one time my mom called me at work. I was like, hey, I'm at work, bye, and just hanging up the phone. Um, so that was, that particular period of time, that was where it was just like, it felt so heavy. And I mean, for me, it was one of those moments where like, my faith in a real authentic way that I did, I would say I didn't have then like really came in. I mean, cause I ended up passing out drunk, which I had never passed out drunk. And I had been getting very, very drunk mm -hmm. <laughs> for quite a while at that point. Um, and that next day I kind of, I think surviving mm -hmm. that moment gave me just that little, it wasn't even a major like, Oh, it was just this little glimmer of hope that I had been missing to just get up, go to work and move forward. I think about the relationships, the people that are closest to you mm -hmm. and navigating through that. Mm -hmm. So one, I know that a lot of times if children aren't responding to parents the way they would prefer, they feel hurt by it, they mm -hmm. feel frustrated by it. Mm -hmm. But then I also think about how a lot of times guys, you know, are oftentimes always looking for some type of relationship, whether it just be physical mm -hmm. or actual full-blown romantic relationship, mm -hmm. while simultaneously maybe dealing with exactly what you were saying you were dealing with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then you have women who were trying to be a partner, mm -hmm. but don't can't put words to, mm -hmm. what's, the, what's this distance? What is this mm -hmm. isolation and that? So yep. uh, I think it's a unique thing um, in terms of romantic relationships and trying to build with somebody that's in that phase yeah but you can allude to that but i want to um kind of get your perspective as someone who was in it how should the surrounding parties best deal with someone who isn't i guess content with their own life mm. um because i do know that 
if you don't understand ideas of depression or categories like that, and yep. if that hasn't been explained to you, and mm -hmm. maybe there's not a diagnosis, what ends up happening is people get frustrated because they feel mm -hmm. like they're being slighted by a loved one. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then that makes it worse if they respond. So yep. how do you feel like would have been the best way to deal with you at that time for other people? Yeah, I would say someone encouraging me to get therapy <laughs> would have been probably one of the best things of just checking in like hey it seems like there's a lot going on but would you have went at the time though or would you, know you get mad at the suggestion um depending on who it came from mm -hmm. so i'll give another example so i was talking to a very very dear person to my life i was this is before this moment this was kind of like another kind of really really dark place moment um and i reached out and i called him and i was like hey Here's how I'm feeling. I just don't feel like I can just like continue going at this rate. This was like during the recession, um, like I guess what it was like 2008 recession or whatever. I couldn't find a job, couldn't do anything. Was sleeping on my um, friend's couch with him and his girlfriend. They were about to have a baby, you know. So I was just feeling like an absolute. I was feeling super low and like a deadbeat. And so I was like, hey, and I said to them, I think I need therapy. And they were like, nah, maybe not. Why don't I just pray for you? Hmm. And I did, I, and I, I, I would say that was kind of like a dagger to the heart. And they did pray for me and it did actually, it was actually really helpful. Um, but I would not necessarily go for, hey, let me pray for you. Particularly if you're a person of faith and you're dealing with someone that is like in a deep, dark, depressed, like, have that consideration for them to allow them to express things and then to follow up like, hey, and even maybe just asking like, hey, do you wanna just talk and let me know how you feel? Do you want a kind of response? Like, what are you thinking about? How I can lovingly support you in this? And asking more questions than maybe giving directives. Uh, I think for me, and I think in that space, that would be helpful. Um, and then maybe I would say, if you are a person of faith and you're in a situation like that, I'm not saying you don't pray for the person, but maybe pray for them privately. Um, take time to do that privately and maybe not directly with them unless that's something that they're asking for. Because I think also, particularly if they're like dealing with shame in their faith or guilt or unworthiness, a lot of times that can only compound some mm -hmm. of those issues because the root issues aren't being addressed for them, it's only kind of bringing up issues that they're already having. Right, yeah. Well, man, you, you've you shared a lot and I, I appreciate it. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you got through uh, what seemed to be a darker phase of life. I know mm -hmm. everything isn't peaches and cream now, but uh, seem to be in a better spot than you were. And I'm glad that you experienced that. Oh yeah, man. And I would just say a big part of that is therapy. Yeah. Like, I mean, I have a great therapist now. Um, I have way better coping strategies to dealing with life. Um, I'm able to, I think, not take even criticism all the time as like a debasement to who I am as a person. And just like, I, yeah, just being able to like learn better, healthy ways to cope with anxiety, with stress. Uh, with my emotions has been, I mean, a plus kind of with, I think also learning for me with my faith, like a healthier form of spirituality um, or Christianity than just like a surface level, what are you presenting, but like what's actually going on internally. Um, and so I think those things have been, have made all the difference. I mean, also, Shout out to my wife, my wife, mm -hmm. in the words of Andy Minio, like getting therapy and getting married are two things I do not regret mm -hmm. at all yeah. um, because they have been such of a, a bedrock of me being able to understand who I am and the contribution that I can give to others. Let's close with this. I get on a high horse about this a, a lot, but <laughs> you have tried a variety of things to cope, mm -hmm. right? And I just know our people. I mm -hmm. know our, our our brothers and how they typically move. Uh, the question isn't even necessarily does it work, but 
what are your thoughts okay. on coping, getting high, getting drunk, drinking or smoking it away? Uh, man. I'm not, I won't give the title of, of the song, but uh, I, there was a song I used to listen to by Kendrick Lamar. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he basically said, is is this a, is this an edited podcast? Or is it edited? I don't know what, but he's like basically he said that you know I'm going through things in life, and Patron and I'll say women make me feel mm-hmm. all right, you know, mm-hmm. and I think it's like you're with those situations like one like health wise with the alcohol you're you're hurting yourself and you're not really dealing with it you're just kind of subduing all of these things by trying to run away from them and not actively in a healthy way, getting support to address the real issues. And then I think also with the relationship stuff, it's like, not only are you damaged, but you're also damaging someone else. And you're going to either have to almost turn off your feelings to be like, well, and that's fine. I can damage them because you know, I'm damaged, whatever, or you're going to start to recognize that damage and it's going to only add, to your sorrow as you're seeing how you're hurting other people by not addressing your own trauma. Mm -hmm. Um, And so for me, I think that is something to just be aware of. It's like, if you want to, and it's just hard, right? It is hard to look yourself in the mirror and be like, yo, there are some things about me that just suck. And I don't even think I can change these things that suck. I don't think there's a way to change it. And so I think for me, that is like one of the things of just like recognizing like whatever, and it doesn't even have to be women, or it can be YouTube, it can be all kind of different things that you use to cope. But it's like, after you put a pause that you think on your problems, your your problems are gonna eventually press play. Right. You know, and so instead of maybe pausing your problems, maybe you need some help and some support to press the slow-mo button on your problems where you can actually see what's happening and understand how to deal with the problems so that you can get to press and play and when those things come up, it's not, oh snap, let me suppress them, but okay, let me recognize what's going on and figure out how I need to navigate because my weaknesses are a part of my strengths. They're together, Mm -hmm. right? And so if I ignore my weaknesses to just live in my strengths, I'm gonna end up even damaging people with my strengths because I don't wanna recognize the places where I'm hurting. Mm-hmm. And that hurt is going to spread. Yeah. Well, that's our time. I'll say you didn't you didn't have to censor those Kendrick bars. <laughs> but thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. <laughs> appreciate it, Malik, man. It's my pleasure, man. Thanks for what you do. Um, and I'm hoping that more of our brothers seek support so that we can continue to grow and develop as people. Absolutely. Absolutely.